We're glad to know that you're still there and watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Right now, we're being joined by our guest, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner who is here in Lagos. And we're looking at some of the papers that um, some of our national dailies, and we have The Punch, The Guardian, and The Nation newspaper this morning. And we could also bring headlines from other uh, papers if we have the time. Good morning, uh, Tunde Kolawole, and welcome to the program this morning. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, we're starting this morning with the Punch newspaper. The Punch newspaper is... Um, I don't know how I can... The Punch newspaper leads with uh, Tinubu panel... Okay, multiple taxation. Tinubu panel asks government to drop 190 taxes. OPS blames states. Okay, that is the leading headlines there. Let's begin with that, Mr. Kolawole. Well, the truth of the matter is that um, all the bans that we have uh, done in the past, they have hardly worked because um, they are unable to kind of police our borders and also the security agencies I find it difficult to ensure that things are properly uh, done. Okay? Don't let us be too pessimistic. Let's uh, hope that uh, this time around the government will be able to get it uh, right. Because if they don't get it right, the consequences can be catastrophic. But the number of taxes that they have been asked to drop, that is really a big number. So how will that work when this government wants to mop up everything to make sure that they make money? Well, the, the government policy or even law is effective only to the extent that uh, it is realistic. You know, we have a situation in which uh, most of um, the citizens are now in a uh, debt poverty. The companies too are all falling off. And the revenue that we get from petroleum uh, products are also not as forthcoming as they used to be. So, it is where the economy is buoyant, where there are productive activities. That is where all this uh, taxation thing uh, works. Imposing multiple taxation on companies that are more that have they been effective? The answer is no. Because the company will only pay their taxes if they are doing well, if they are making profits. If the business environment is conducive for them to be able to try, as I have to say, the truth of the matter is that uh, the economy is in shambles, and so corporate taxes or company taxes, apartment income taxes, are really difficult to enforce in this kind of an environment. So, if uh, the economy still doesn't work the way it's going to work. I don't see how the tax policies and regime of the government is going to be effective or work. I doubt it. Okay. Um, so we move to another headline that we have here. Senate probes 11 trillion Naira refinery repairs summons Kiari. That uh, the two one year or other about that President Buhari was going to leave office, he awarded the Jumbo contract for the overhauling of the refinery. And a lot of eyebrows were raised at that period in time. Now, why does the government not leave that to 
the incoming administration so as to ensure effective their supervision and what have you. But the government didn't listen and uh, they went there and read and awarded the contract. And I think they also gave a deadline in which the refinery repairs will be completed. If after the deadline has, um, has passed and those refineries are still not working, I think the Senate will be right to insist on the proof of what happened to the trillions of naira that have been spent to overhaul those refineries. But the bitter truth is that uh, people want to be honest with ourselves. Is that each time elections are coming, all the government needs money, all the individual, key individuals in government need money for certain things. That is when they remember to repair to overhaul the refineries. That is when they also remember to maintain the third million bridge in Lagos. I remember when the Northern was ready to have another election, he awarded a uh, Jumbo contract for the repairs of the third million bridge in Lagos. Since he has left office, some other government that have come after him have also awarded contract for the maintenance of that bridge. And even recently, I think about a week or two ago, the present government also said it was doing maintenance on the third mainland bridge. So it is not just in the area of refineries alone that we see all these malfeasances. It cut across all areas of our lives in which uh, contracts are awarded and they are never executed. So, look. The question we want to ask to the Senate be able to work his talk, he will be able to do a thorough job, he will be able to prove the NNPC and the other may be connected with the quota that was awarded for the maintenance of that return of the family running to eleven trillion in Ireland. If we take the antecedents of the Nigerian legislator, it's only the National Assembly into consideration. I doubt whether they able to work their thoughts. Remember, it was even when uh, this, uh, the present Senate president was, I think, a uh, chairman of NDDC, yeah. or was the chairman of the United States Development Commission, that it was an issue of approval, what was happening in that area. And then there had to be a shout at the approval uh, panel for somebody to off the microphone mm. so that the Nigerian people will not have the benefits of learning what transpired. This same Chinese president, you remember, accused the, the National Assembly of being the one connecting most of the contracts mm. that are coming out of in the NDGC, the Niger Delta, but also in the health sector. So if the legislators or if some members of the National Assembly have also been involved in this time around maintenance of some of these refineries, running to a level three in Iran, I don't see how the Senate can do a thorough job of investigating the NNPC and the repairs of the refineries. Mm. It's a complicated issue, which means Nigerians may just say uh, goodbye to that uh, probe, because we're also wondering why uh, they are just talking about the refineries now. Everything is just interwoven. And, and NDDC was chaired or was led by Akwabio, who is trying to probe, like you have just pointed out. And you have said that they may not do a very thorough job. We also are wondering what happened to uh, the airlines, Nigeria Air, whose logo was contracted to a foreign firm that did the logo and spent millions of naira on a logo that could have been done in Nigeria. We're also wondering what they're going to do about that. Well, they've already been asked in the past to off the mic. I don't know how many more mics they're going to off right now, and the people will forget about it. But we have something that, you know, some people are saying, well, it's a good start, a good sign that the future might be good because the EFCC chair has ordered the staff to declare assets. Uh, that was done yesterday, and um, 
uh, some people are optimistic that if he has done this, because he even said that he has declared it and the secretary has also declared it. So everybody from level 17 downwards needs to declare their assets so that they can live above board. What is your comment? Well, it's um, a good directive that all staff of the EFCC should declare their assets. Uh, there is a popular saying that uh, before you begin to remove the log in some other person's eye, you should remove the speck in your own eyes first. And we also see that charity begins uh, at all. So if the present chairman is able to enforce that is directive, I think it would be a good uh, policy, it would be a good direction to need to go. So that when some of these talkers have issues, we have a benchmark mm. with which to evaluate whatever assets uh, they may have accumulated before the declaration of the asset and after the declaration of the asset. But our experience has shown, just like the probe we are talking, we talked about a little while ago, that people in this country have a way of manipulating the asset declarations. We have even seen in the past, in which a former Senate president was alleged to have declared uh, assets in anticipation of properties and uh, resources and monies to anticipate the might be acquiring. So, if our people are smart as to be doing an anticipated declaration of assets, sometimes we begin to wonder in what way will this uh, declaration of assets uh, lead to sanity leads to integrity, leads to uh, I mean, corruption in some of these uh, public um, uh, places. I think I said the correction in Nigeria has become nearly a ritual which public officers and civil servants uh, are led to indulge them, they are led to do, they just to satisfy all uh, righteousness. And I do not know how many people have been convicted taken to the um, uh, court of conduct tribunal, court to the regular courts, how uh, many have been convicted based on the false declaration of assets? Very, very few, to the best of my knowledge. Mm. But at least let this be done so that in case there are issues in the future, we need to revisit whatever assets some of these people may be claiming to have acquired in the future, we will at least have some records of what they have declared. Mm. I, I don't know how they are going to do that, because if I go to my village now and I'm buying land for, let's say, 500,000 uh, naira, uh, and I want to declare my asset, I could decide to, to give the price that is obtainable in Lagos State. Uh, maybe that same uh, uh, land of 500,000 naira I will say, I will say it costs like land in Banana Island or, or in Ikoi and all that. There's no way of catching me. Well, my, my worry and the worry of a lot of Nigerians is that, um, as we've said several times on the show and elsewhere, um, we like setting up panels to probe some things. And after that, we get very beautiful reports that never see the light of day. Uh, we've had so many examples that we cannot even begin to mention here right now. The question is, how do we begin to get results from all this probe that we've been doing? What can we do differently, apart from just setting up panels to investigate and it never sees the light of day? Well, uh, from um, what we have seen as a nation, or from the president that we have had, I think our best bet is to find ways and means to ensure that a looting, that a stealing, that money laundry does not uh, occur in some of these public spaces. Rather than after they have occurred, we begin to use very good money 
to take a very bad uh, debt. And that is why we want to commend the single treasury policy of the federal government, even though it is in the now being badly implemented. Rather than put everybody in the same basket in Abuja, the thing should have been done in a very sectoral manner. We could ask the universities to maintain their own single treasury account, ask the polytechnic to maintain their single treasury account, ask the ministries to maintain their single treasury account, and then maybe the parasitum. By that method, you don't have a kind of uh, uh, little company or what they call it, a behemoth, which will even be very difficult to be able to work with and also to, 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 to monitor. So, we as a nation have changed, I mean, faced a lot of challenges. But no matter what policy programs and safeguards we put on ground, human ingenuity is uh, something else that we really cannot contain. As soon as we block one loophole, they begin to, I mean, to, to, to create uh, 10 other ones. The emphasis from that will be that we should be emphasizing integrity, uh, honesty, and then uh, continue to encourage the children right from youth to see corruption as a anathema, and that integrity is very, very important. If we don't have people who have respect for the rule of law, too, in some of these places and all that, no matter what program policies are in order to put on ground, you will never be effective. You always find ways to circumvent those things. So, in those days, I remember when we were in primary, secondary school and all that, they used to give us or teach us civic education. Mm. And with patriotism, pity, honesty, and what have you are taught. I'm not too sure that uh, those things, that the civic education is being taught in our schools again. Just like we took away history. Mm. And believing or behaving like people who have no power. We may have taken civic education also out of the curriculum of our schools. So, if we could revisit those things and all that, and then also ensure that the politics or some of these public spaces are not as lucrative as they are now. The public rules have some sanity in some of these areas. Mm. Okay. Um, the the reps, House of Representatives has faulted the CBN's forex ban lift, and uh, NECA is kicking against it and saying that uh, these things were not banned uh, in 2015. But the fact of the matter remains that 43 items uh, that had forest bans ban has been have been cleared, and now the forest forex ban is no longer there. So they can access this forex and import the 43 um, items. And people are asking uh, if this is being done. How is it going to help in the campaign for the consumption of made in Nigeria goods? <coughs> That's a very damning question that you have asked. You know, you remember that in the past, I wouldn't know whether it was a Chibobase Naulo and the steel at that point in time that sold this policy of indigenization policy to the federal government. It's the case also a uh, corporate. At that period in time, there are certain businesses, a certain goods and services that were supposed to be produced locally and which you cannot access foreign exchange to buy from abroad. And with that, a lot of local industry, corporate industries at local level, at household levels and what have you, sprang up at that point in time. But surprisingly, some people also sold the idea to the federal government at that point in time to kill the digitalization policy. We collect that when the indigenization policy was in there, all those foreign companies like Cadby uh, and Water Dunlop and Water Avion, they were headed by Nigerian CEOs. And uh, with that, 
the country has some leverage on what is being done in some of those companies. But immediately that indigenization policy was revised and all that. The expatriate uh, CEOs returned, and then no manners of people now also begin to engage in businesses that ordinarily should be reserved for the Nigerian people. So, for example, what business has uh, somebody from India got to do to come into Nigeria to take bread or to start distributing conventionally? What business does this man have to start giving only exchange to somebody who wanted to import too quick into Nigeria? So, the truth of the matter is that there must be one form of decision or the other if the economy is going to work well. You don't throw everything open the way and manner you have thrown it open. Especially when the resources are not there. Look at the canton of champagne that is being important to this country. Do you know some of these refineries too? Some of the products that they sell in Nigeria today have been imported from abroad. You see, they really had scarce resources, scarce foreign estate to import those things. Well, it's the ban, I think I agree with Mecca that the ban should not have been listened to as in the ban in India. Because it would have been better to extend the ban to so many things. The listing of the ban that they have done now presently, the now in my opinion, is going to lead to an influx of all manners of things. The ordinary law we shouldn't be allocating scan falling and things to point to the country. One good example is a toothpick, which mostly comes from abroad now, when an ordinary carpenter in one of the corner of his premises could be producing toothpicks and packaging it and distributing and selling the different supermarkets all over the country and also selling to the to the to the food, uh, uh, to the restaurants and all that we have uh, all over the place. The present government, from this policy that they have uh, now embarked upon, will appear to me to be confused as regards the direction which they want to take the Nigerian economy to. And if they are confused, they are not clear that they have what they should be doing, then that would be very risky, that would be very dangerous to the world of the Nigerian economy. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we go to the Nation newspaper, it's almost the same um, headline we've already talked about. Federal government unfolds forex tax jobs investment policies, and uh, the rider is uh, 260 taxes to be uh, slashed to single digit. Uh, merging of BDCs. Forex apps, uh, dealers into official FX market, and all that. Okay, but we have this. Uh, I don't know how, how disturbing it will be to you because it is very disturbing to me. Oil thieves deploy CCTV mortar launchers along pipeline routes. Oil thieves are the ones now deploying CCTV, which should have been deployed by our security personnel and all that to watch and see how these people are vandalizing or or, or stealing our, our oil from our pipelines. But the thieves now are the ones deploying the CCTV to look out for the security personnel that might be in one area or the other and know how to avoid them and then to steal our oil. How do you feel about this? For me, it's really disturbing. <laughs> mm, don't, don't, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the last topic we took before this one. Mm. But the Nigerian people are very critical to their geniuses. But uh, immediately you are brought in one before, you will begin to create another one. This story you have just said is a very good example of uh, that engine, that creativity, when the Nigerian people are being referred to. The truth of the matter is that. Uh, whether they deploy a CCTV or a motor launcher, or even take a more time to the Niger Delta to be using to steal oil and order. It is still the government and the security people in the country that we should blame. After all, when you steal oil, either delivered from the railway or copied from the pipe that is supposed to be discharging crude oil. 
with a ship that is battered in the Atlantic Ocean. They will keep you some vessels in there. You will keep put some trucks on the road to be able to vary this uh, crude oil from one point to the other. So that is the, the, the case. And you have all manners of security. There is no complement of security that you don't have in the oil sector. The police are there, the army is there, the navy is there, the DSS is there, the civil defense is there. Because the civil defense was created to protect uh, the country's infrastructure and all that. But if all these things are still happening, in spite of the layers upon layers of security that we have in that, uh, in that place, we should know that certain island place individuals are behind some of these things. And that the government itself is not sincere about ensuring integrity in the, in the oil sector, simply because a lot of people benefit from the malfeasances that is taking place in those, um, in those places. A CCTV camera, a motor launcher are not used, but cannot be easily uh, seen when they are being uh, installed. And the uh, citizens will also help the oil chiefs to go and uh, install CCTV cameras in certain places. And also those who have them to take uh, deliver water launchers along the pipelines and all that. If they were the traffic citizens, they would have reported something to the government or to the police or to the security people when they are being uh, asked or being recruited or being uh, asked to come and install uh, those things. But the country is uh, a no man's land. Everybody don't do what they like. Where we show the patriotic and report things that are also that we see around us, we turn a blind eye and uh, they clear to some of those things. Forgetting that um, whatever happens in the oil sector or the petroleum sector directly affects all of us as a people as a nation. It affects the life of 200 million Nigerians. Because we don't sell oil, we don't have our currency to import medicine, building materials, pay salaries, and what have you. So we are like a nation that cuts their own nose in order to spite themselves. It is a tragic. But if I was the president, I will see all the security chief. I can't take you for those kind of things that she said, uh, uh, that the people have reported. We now find the uh, in the Niger Delta, in the oil um, areas. The next question you want to ask is, uh, what happened to the billions of Naira security pipeline uh, protection and oil well protection uh, uh, contracts that were awarded to some of the Niger Delta militants and what have you? Could it be that they're now eating their cake and having it, that they get contract to protect the pipeline and the oil wells and all that? And also are unable to police or may even be directly involved in the stealing of the oil. All this is boiled down to discipline. Lack of accountability across boards, whether from the level of citizenship or from the level of those who are our leaders in the different types of government, from local government to state government to federal government. Because in some of these places that TV cameras are being installed, and motor launchers have been uh, deployed. There is a local government chama in India. There is a council over there. There are DPS or police stations in those places and all that. There are probably some of naval bases in some of those places. Where are all these people when all these things are taking place? I have canvassed this idea before. But uh, we need to really do a kind of uh, convoke a conference. We need all the leaders to sign a moratorium on corruption and say, look, we have had enough of this. If the country is not going to flames, we all must just do things right. But if the Indian leaders won't do that, and it works for them, all the leaders of course, all those who matter, agree among themselves that they will not engage in any of those some practices they do, that have the tendency to undermine the economy and the policy of the Indian nation. And then from there, they began to move forward. 
and the economy began to grow. And those who went back on their commitment to those moratorium of corruption, there were two punishments that were due to them when they are uh, when they are caught from breaking the oath they have taken, not to engage in unwholesome practices that uh, affect the economy, that affect the inequality, and that undermine the welfare of their citizenship. That's my take. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> Very funny. It really is very funny when, when you see that the thieves are the ones doing uh, what they should do. It's like you have a house and then instead of you buying a, a guard dog, it's the thieves that are now buying the dogs to come and, <laughs> to come and drive you away from your house. It, it really is funny and scary. It, it's very disturbing to some of us. This is, these are things that the security should do and they're not doing. The thieves are doing instead. Um, now to political matters, more or less. Uh, U.S. court rejects request for FBI's report on Tinubu. Well, uh, these are very interesting times. Uh, let me take on uh, this as Bakuba. I've admonished uh, those of us who are, who are lawyers to refrain from uh, commenting on this Tinubu issue especially because the case is at the Supreme Court, so that that court could have uh, the free hand to do justice to all the parties before it can not run. But with that as it may, let me quickly say this, that uh, whatever we say, or whatever may be the outcome of uh, the other reports that the FBI is doing how to release and work out, I doubt whether it's going to have any effect or any consequences on the case that is uh, presently before the, the Supreme uh, Court. The, the leader or the dog or the cock or the goat has voted before we start uh, putting on the latches and what have you. We should also remember that the law in America is different from the law here in Nigeria. Uh, whatever, like I said, the president will just be having some moral uh, body to bear. Uh, if any other damaging report is released uh, about him, I don't see it having any serious consequences with regards to what the Supreme Court might come up with in the appeal that is now before, before it. But like I said, you could have the court judgment and also suffer a very serious and moral defeat. It's, it's what they call a, a, a is it a fiery duty or fiery duty, uh, um, a, a, a victory rather, when you have a victory that cost you more than if you had even <laughs> lost the battle. Okay. Uh, we'll move now. Okay, before we move, still on the Nation newspaper, we've seen one of the headlines there, and it, uh, it keeps occurring. The Senate defends, the Senate defends the six, 160 million Naira uh, purchase of the SUVs for senators. The senators are defending it. Uh, directly, it is read, uh, it reads, Senate defends 160 million Naira USV uh, for National Assembly members. 160 million in this time. Please, let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, we said before that uh, the, what we have in the corner, the people we have uh, in some of these public places as politicians, are not leaders, but the rulers. They are emperors. And their case can be likened to that of Nero, uh, who was a plain city when Rome was uh, born. And then also to the case of uh, one of the French emperors, who when the people were rioting that there were no bread, to eat in all their towns, the wife of the emperor said, let them go and eat cake. 
you forgot that uh, it is a flour that is used to making bread, that is also used to bake uh, the cake. The truth of the matter is that uh, the people in the National Assembly of the Nigerian politicians are impervious to the feelings of our people because they know they don't depend on us to win elections. And after they have smoked themselves or leave themselves into office, we are powerless to recall them back or to remove them. So, if they go to the National Assembly, if we are using their own devices, ways and means, and we are powerless to recall them or remove them from there, why would they listen to the news and cry of uh, the ordinary citizens not to begin to buy for themselves very cool to work on a fifty million dollars they are passing. When the ordinary Nigerians, when we have not been able to provide the ordinary Nigerians a bag of rice for households, but rather we are giving them maybe one one cup and then expecting that that to the elevate their own gas and then banish poverty in our midst. Well, like we said before, all this is boils down to discipline. And it also boils down to this, uh, uh, I don't care if it's what they say. Let them make noise from uh, now to eternity. That is never likely to have any serious uh, consequences or damage for not as a people. We know the lady that in some other countries of the world, a very case like this will be enough to bring down the government, especially given the challenges that we are all facing as a nation now. Every day you open the Nigeria newspaper, you find people hungry themselves because they are unable to feed themselves. You find people selling their own children, selling their own babies because they couldn't pay out rent. You find those banks now renting out or hiring, giving out their wives for some other people to sleep with. Under the belief that uh, whatever they are able to get from the mass, they need to take care of the houses and all that. Our level of uh, uh, our feelings has degenerated to that level that anything now goes in the country. Well, like we said, leadership and accountability okay. people just be left to the UFCC, to the IFCC, or to even the police alone to enforce and ensure if politicians are not doing the right thing. Under our law, citizens can also begin to protest. They can carry out, they can go to the National Assembly and to begin the to National demonstrate Assembly. or recall them. To begin to insist mm. that that policy of buying vehicles should be dropped immediately. We also have read in the papers that some houses that the Genesis Corporation job was said to have sold. And that means we are in the U.S. on weekend, Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, is revoking the sales of those houses and all that. What happened with some of those properties? These were houses okay. that were in the All right. It was either for politicians, for national assembly members. Sometimes, sometimes it's really difficult to talk about these uh, things uh, because you can just flare up and be angry about the, the way things are going. But it's unfortunate this is where we can, we, uh, this is how much we can go today, uh, Mr. Kolawole. I uh, would like to thank you for coming on the program this morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, we've been talking with uh, a legal practitioner, Mr. Tunde Kolawole. He talks to us from Lagos State here. We'll take a very short break, and after that, we'll be joined by Nika Gule to be talking about the problems of housing in Nigeria and how to solve them. Stay with us. <laughs>